When I was six years old, I had a dream in which I was playing a 3D game, flying the infamous snow speeder from the movie The Empire Strikes Back. I remember the frustration I felt after waking up and realizing I could not play that game, since there was nothing like it at the time. I thought it to be a romantic idea, using my acquired knowledge about computer graphics as an adult to make my past self's dream come true. After my last project, in which I built a 2D top-down space shooter using ChatGPT, I thought to myself, wow, this took me only one day to finish. How about doing a similar simple game but in 3D? It surely will not take me more than a week. Well. It took me much longer than expected, but I learned a lot and was eventually able to finish it. In this video I will take you through the main aspects of the game, so you will get an understanding of what it takes to translate our 2D game into 3D. Let's go! We can take some inspiration from our window creation code of our 2D game. One fundamental part that changes is the initialization of the renderer. We will build our own renderer from scratch utilizing the OpenGL API to be able to render 3D graphics. First we need to initialize our window with the appropriate OpenGL flag and secondly we will use GLAD as a library that loads pointers to OpenGL functions at runtime. There are many options out there but the benefit of GLAD is the ability to include it as a header only library doesn't get much simpler than that. Once that is set up, we can test our code. And our first step is done, we got a window. Pretty underwhelming, but we'll get there. Now let's get serious. How do we actually render 3D objects? There are amazing write-ups on the topic on the web, one of my favorite one being Learn OpenGL. I will not get into a lot of detail, since this would be way out of scope for this video. Please refer to some of the materials I mentioned during the video if you wish to get more details on any topic. You may know that 3D objects in video games are usually built from a fundamental shape, a triangle. So let's set this as our first goal, render a triangle to the screen. For that we will declare a buffer object which holds all necessary data to describe our triangle. That object will then be loaded into our GPU's memory using the OpenGL API. Having the data is not enough, we also need to tell our GPU how to process that data. That's what shaders are for small programs that tell the GPU how to transform the data in our buffers. Once we combine these concepts, we are able to draw first shape on the screen. Okay, but we want to render something more serious. On the web I found this amazing model of a snow speeder. For loading the data of the model into memory, I made use of two popular libraries. One being SSIMP for handling the data format of our model and the other being the STB image loading library. Following the same concept of rendering our triangle, we will get something. Well, clearly we are rendering the model, we can see the exhaust grills, but everything seems mashed together and there is no sense of three-dimensionality. We will need some serious math to get going. Let's start with some intuitive concepts. We want to be able to express the position, rotation and scale of our object in 3D space. We can express these with a scary sounding term called affine transformations. Simply speaking, these are a type of functions that preserve the parallelism and relative distance between points. We can encode translation, rotation and scaling of a model into a matrix that we will call the model matrix. There will also be a unique matrix in our scene called the view matrix, which represents the position and orientation of our camera. Imagine your monitor center being the origin relative to our camera's transform. By multiplying our model matrix with the view matrix, we will perform a transform into the view space, encoding our object's coordinates relative to the camera. Finally, we will need a transform for giving our scene a sense of depth. That is what a projection matrix is for. Depending on what effect you are looking for, there are different ways to construct the projection matrix. In our case we want to perform a perspective transform, which simulates the way objects appear when viewed from a particular perspective or point of view. After this final transform, our model's coordinates will be mapped into a cube-like shape. This is called the clip space, since it clips all parts of objects away that will not be rendered onto the screen given the current perspective. Once we got our object's coordinates in clip space, we can let OpenGL handle the rendering of pixels onto our screen. While this will be enough to get our 3D object rendered while rotating, we still don't see any contours or shadows. That's because we have not described a lightning model in our shader yet. For this game I will stick to a simple blind fong lightning model. Adding some texture rendering and we got ourselves a nice snow speeder. Pretty cool. To get any sense of speed while moving through our scene, I wanted to create some terrain which loosely resembles the snow dunes of Hoth. There is an amazing video series on procedural terrain generation on YouTube from a guy called Simon Dev. Following some of his videos, I was able to create my own terrain generation tool to create a simple world. Next I created a component for capturing user input and mapping that into roll, pitch and yaw rotations, so we are able to control our snow speeder. 
positioning the camera behind the model and adding some velocity to our flight code, we have our first flyby. The movement still looks pretty rigid and it doesn't look like we're actually controlling a spaceship. Simple trick to add more sense of movement is adding some interpolation between the model's orientation and our camera's orientation. Now it looks like we're actually flying a spaceship. How cool is that? What is the only next reasonable thing to do? That's right, laser guns. To render our laser shots, I use a simple technique to render 2D sprites in our 3D scene, which is called billboarding. And now we are able to generate laser shots when pressing the spacebar. For our enemy, I found these amazing models of Death Star surface parts. I took the turret model and quickly imported it into our scene. To be able to move the turret parts, we have to introduce the concept of transform hierarchies. Basically, any non-trivial 3D model will be a composite of several models organized in a hierarchy. When applying a transform to a model up in the hierarchy, we need to apply it to the children as well. We do that by keeping track of our parent and children in each model's transform component. When updating the world matrix of a particular transform node, we need to multiply the parent's model matrix with the model's local model matrix. This way, our transforms trickle down to the children models. This can be seen here, where the base part of the turret's yaw rotation is also applied to the guns, which is a separate model in the hierarchy. Now we just need to calculate the direction from the enemy to our player to get the updated orientation of the model. When flying by, we see that the turret follows the player correctly. I also added a particle generator to the enemy to be able to shoot lasers. Speaking of shooting each other, we should implement a way to display our health bar. For that I used this texture which displays an empty and full state of a health bar. In our shader we then modify the texture coordinate offset depending on the fill level, thus rendering only part of the top half and part of the bottom half of the texture at a time. Here we can see the speed of our spaceship being rendered as a blue bar on top of our health bar. Next I want to add a sky to our scene. This shader simply draws a gradient and when applied to a huge sphere acts as our sky. Seems like things are going pretty well and smoothly. What could go wrong at that point, right? Let's talk about physics. The most important thing to know for our game is when a laser has intersected with an enemy or the player. To keep rendering time below 16 milliseconds, physics engines assume simple shapes to calculate collision detection. Testing each triangle in our scene would just take too long. So first we have to decide on the geometry models that will represent our spaceship, turrets and laser shots. For our laser we will use an infinite ray and knowing the position and length of our laser shot will help us to determine whether the collision actually occurred or not. For our enemies and the player models a bounding box will be a good enough approximation for now. Having these models we can formulate the problem as detecting an intersection between an axis aligned bounding box and a ray. Luckily we don't have to develop such an algorithm since this topic is very well researched. On the web you can find this great write-up on an efficient implementation of the so-called slab method. The idea behind it is pretty simple. Let's say we have this blue bounding box and two rays. To understand the slab method we first have to define what a slab is. In the original paper the authors called the space between two parallel planes a slab. In our particular case the two planes define the axis aligned bounding boxes extend along a particular axis. To perform the test we first convert the ray into the axis aligned bounding boxes local coordinate system and we then check the intersection between the ray and the slabs. You can also think about it as clipping the ray by each pair of parallel planes and if any portion of the ray remains it intersected the box. In this example we see that after testing against the x and y axis slabs only a part of ray 2 remains which means it collided with our bonding box while ray 1 did not. And finally we have a game. We can detect the collision of the laser shots and reduce the entity's health accordingly. But my brain didn't want to stop there. I also wanted to detect whether the player crashes into the ground. For that we can make use of a technique called the separating axis theorem. It is described in the collision detection bible, real time collision detection. We will be testing our player bounding box against a low resolution mesh of the ground, thus testing against single triangles. This algorithm works by doing a separating axis test for each edge of our shapes. Let's say we start with the edge of this triangle. We construct a line by calculating the normal of the edge. We then project every point of our shape onto that line. Once we have done that, we find the minimum and maximum points for each shape. The test then checks whether the intervals of the two shapes overlap. If they do not overlap, it means that for this particular edge the shapes do not collide and we have found a separating axis. After implementing these concepts, we can see once our player touches the ground, their health is reduced to zero. And that concludes our physics system.
Honestly, this took me a while to get going, but seeing it finally work was worth the effort. Now I want to be able to render some text on the screen so we can create a simple menu. While this was pretty simple using the 2D renderer of SDL in our last project, things get a little more complicated with our custom 3D renderer. By checking the Learn OpenGL page, you can learn more about the details of how this works. In general, we will have to create a texture for each symbol and then render that to the screen. We make use of the FreeType library, which is widely used for transforming two type fonts into texture data. Since I'm a pretty bad writer, I asked our old friend ChatGPT to come up with a short dialogue between our main character and a commander. After showing the title screen, we will play the short dialogue as an intro to our mission. I also added a picture showing the controls. With SDL it's pretty easy to set up support for different input devices, so I added support for my Xbox One controller as well. For sound we can just make use of the same library we used before, which is SDL Mixer. For obvious reasons I cannot play the music I chose for the game in this video. Feel free to check it out by downloading the game on itch.io. With every start of the game, I randomly position the enemies on our map. Since the map is pretty big and I was too lazy to implement a minimap, I came up with a small game mechanic that would guide the player to their next target. The idea is pretty simple. Using the dot product of two vectors, you can get an indication of the rate that the two vectors are pointing in the same direction. I then find the closest enemy to the player and compare the vector pointing towards the player with the velocity vector of the player. A negative dot product will indicate that we are moving towards the target, while a positive dot product means that we are moving away from it. I can then simply map the result of the dot product onto the volume range of a target computer sound effect to give an indication to the player if they are moving in the right direction. It seems to work pretty well and I think it's actually more fun than just following around an arrow to your next target. The game is basically finished by now. There is one last thing I want to talk about that helped me a lot to organize my code and deal with the switching of game states, for example when moving from the main menu into the game. Game Programming Patterns is an awesome free resource to learn about useful coding patterns in the context of game development. There is a write-up on the state pattern which I implemented for my use case. I defined a state for each game scenario and then have an execution class handle the transition between these states. The pattern gives you an easy way to define things that need to happen on entering or exiting a certain state. Although I said the game was finished, there are many things that I would like to improve. First and foremost, I think what is really missing is a particle system for explosion effects. That would probably be the one thing I would like to add. Apart from that, there are many improvements that could be made, especially in the code. But this was more of a learning experience and one big goal was to finish the project, which I did. So I hope to improve upon these things in my next projects. If you survived this far into the video, I want to thank you for your attention. If you liked what you see and would like to see more, be sure to leave a like. See you next time.